Okay, I think we'll make a start now. <clears throat> we, we have a lot of uh, information, a lot of content to go through with you. <clears throat> so first of all, many thanks for um, joining us today for, for the webinar. Um, this is sponsored by Agrino. And it's about harnessing AI to predict and prevent costly recalls. <clears throat> and I'll do introductions of of myself and 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 the other speaker in in a little uh, a little time from now. But really, we want to try to make this as interactive as possible. So as myself and Elias are talking and presenting, please feel free to ask questions, put it into the chat, <clears throat> and towards the end of the webinar, we we will we'll, we have reserved some time to deal with any of your questions. And as I always say. I take the easy questions and I give Elias the difficult questions. That is the agreement that we have reached. So Elias, once again, thank you very much for agreeing to that. <laughs> so you're welcome, Chris. Yeah. So if we move to the first slide, then Elias. So what we will be talking about at today's webinar is around the, the food safety landscape some of the big issues, some of the problems, the difficulties that because of all of the complexities of the modern day food supply system that, that, that many people within the food industry face. And what we hope that we will achieve is really giving you a better understanding of how forecasting works. And I, and, and I, I guess all of us have done some form of for, forecasting and this is particularly around how artificial intelligence can be used as a tool to forecast. Elias is then going to take us through a number of use cases, actually three different use cases, all very, very different that happened in 2023. And, and, and again, Elias will show you some very nice data about did the forecasting work, did it not work? How big a red flag did, did the forecasting give you? And then myself and Elias, we're going to reflect a little bit on, on the uh, use cases themselves and on the, 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 the emerging importance of, of AI in terms of, of the food safety landscape. And of course, then we want to give you the opportunity to ask all of your questions. So again, any questions you have, please put them into the chat box. So next slide, please, Elias. Now, for introductions, um, I, I'm the much, much better looking guy on the left hand side of your screen. I'm Chris Elliott, um, very well disguised. I'm Professor of Food Safety and Microbiology at Queen's University, Belfast. I'm an honorary professor there now, but I also do a lot of work for different um, uh, government agencies, uh, particularly the UN agencies in, 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 in terms of, of major issues around food safety in, in different parts of the world. But much more important in terms of the webinar and, and the information that you're going to, to get, I'm very pleased to, to, to introduce you to Elias Antonopoulos, who is a machine learning engineer at Agrino, and, and Elias will be really dealing with that, but with the machine learning and, and the how you actually use AI. So we're very pleased, Elias and I, as, as a double act, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a very good webinar together. So next slide, please, Elias. So the first, I think, important piece of information you probably know already, but the number of food recalls is rising. I, I actually checked the statistics earlier on today, and generally in Europe, there are over 1,000 food recalls per quarter now. Really, really high number, and that number keeps rising. I also checked on the in the United States, and, 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 and the data is very, very similar. Food recalls keep on rising. And these are unbelievably difficult. They're very expensive to manage and, and can cause massive reputational damage to companies, but also can cause major harm to consumers who are exposed to potentially dangerous food. 
<clears throat> now, the reasons why the numbers of recalls are rising, there, there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, there, there's lots of complexities, as you might expect. And what we've listed some of them, I mean, the novel foods, the, the emerging foods are becoming, you know, more and more um, frequently frequent. I was told there was over 4,000 uh, novel food products launched in Europe in 2023 alone. And we have massive issues in different parts of the world in terms of the geopolitics, which are causing massive disruptions to supply chains. There, there are issues about availability. Some foodstuffs are being kept in transport much longer than they were previous because it's it, it's get, getting much more difficult in some places to move food around the world. But I think the single biggest factor is our changing climate. And as a food safety professional, I just see more and more issues around climate change. So I think the bad news is the number of recalls is likely to keep increasing, being driven by many factors, but our climate, the most important of all of those. So the next slide, please, Elias. Now, I think in terms of the needs of, of food and beverage companies, I mean, I'm a university academic, but I, I work with many, many companies, local companies, but right through to multinational companies. And I think there are three really important needs. And that is the complete overview and that is really, let's call it the dashboard of what's happening at any given time. Really important to track that because if you're not really aware of what's going on, and, and sometimes the data, even if you're a European country or a company, it's really important to know what's going on in the United States or in Southeast Asia or China as well, because what happens in one part of the world is most likely going to happen in another part as well. So that complete overview is very important. And also the fact that it needs to be continuously updated. And, and, and the, the reason for continuous updates is if you're only looking at data once a year and you're, you're, you're making all of your decisions about risk management and about, about sampling and testing programs, my goodness, you can be in for a shock because th things can crop up very, very quickly. And that idea of doing something once a year, it's a little bit last century, to be honest with you. So we've got to think now more about continuously updating all of databases. And then the, the third item is having so much more data is the ability to anticipate future risks. And if you can anticipate future risks, you can certainly have a much, much better way of trying to prevent your company being involved in, in such a risk or, or at least mitigating against some, some of the major um, um, outcomes that can happen. So in terms of, of AI and food safety, um, it, it's interesting because virtually not a week goes past where on a news channel you will hear about something about AI. Sometimes it's very positive, sometimes it's quite negative, but it is becoming more and more a part of everyday life and everyday business. I, I would say every working day, I will be involved in, in AI in some way. And, and generally it's about having large data sets and how to exploit that data. We, we will think about what the potential AI solutions are. So AI is becoming much, much more commonplace now. Now in terms of food safety, it's still quite new. It's still quite novel. And I think the, 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 when we talk about development, the development of AI models, again, Elias will, will give us much more information about how that actually works. And having the models is fantastic, but my goodness, they have to be accurate. And I have seen many people develop wonderful AI models, or they think they're wonderful, except they don't work. And, and that's what you've got to be so careful of. This is really quite complicated mathematics, complicated um, um, computer science, machine learning. And it, it's that, that skill base that comes together to develop these accurate models. So I think now on the next slide, it's my turn to pass over to you, Elias, and, and we can listen to you about forecasting and how this works. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Elias Antonopoulos, and as Chris uh, mentioned, I work as a machine learning engineer at the data science department at Agrono. 
Uh, my job is basically to develop and evaluate AI models that uh, try to tackle important uh, problems around food safety. And at the same time, I try to ensure that every such result from an AI model that one can see on our Food AI platform uh, is properly delivered uh, by our machine learning system and also it's accurate, as Chris mentioned. So let's dive, straight, let's dive straight into it and see what AI forecasting is by walking through some examples. The first example I have here, um, we have a visualization uh, that depicts the beer production uh, of Australia um, expressed on a quarterly basis from 2000 until 2010 uh, in the form of time series. So most of you are very fairly, let's say, uh, familiar with this form of data. It's called time series. And forecasting in this context uh, would be our estimation of how the beer production in Australia is going to evolve uh, over the next uh, months. As you can see here in this example, uh, the blue line represents this exact uh, forecasting. Now, uh, this example actually is actually very simple, and I bet most of us here in this webinar uh, could easily produce uh, such an estimation empirically uh, without any knowledge of uh, machine learning or computer science. And the reason that we can do that is that because we're able to observe a very clean and periodic pattern on the past data. So you can see here that, for example, every year we have a spike on the Australian beer production. Uh, but the real problem begins when we have a lot of data that can be noisy and uh, have irregular patterns. Or, or, for example, when we have a lot of data, uh, uh, when we have problems uh, that you have to take a lot more factors into account that can influence future beer production in Australia. Uh, in those kinds of cases where the problem is more complex and the factors are more, uh, we have to resort to a more systematic approach. Um, so let's see another example here, perhaps uh, a bit more useful to our everyday lives than the quarterly beer production of Australia. Um, a disclaimer, if we have any Australians with us here today, I meant no harm with this comment. Uh, I'm sure beer production is equally important to you. Uh, so what's, what's up with uh, weather forecasting? Uh, weather forecasting is one of the oldest and most researched <clears throat> and well-established fields of forecasting. And uh, almost every day we're informed about the weather forecast for the next couple of days. And this very practical knowledge uh, helps us uh, to better schedule our routines and our obligations. Um, some professionals, for example, farmers, uh, take a lot of value out of a good and reliable weather forecast. So it's a good example to keep uh, in mind. And we keep this example in mind here at Agrono uh, because we try to create a reliable forecast for the food safety professionals that can give them a lot of value throughout their business year. Um, let's go to the next slide. And okay, let's, let's dive a bit, uh, a bit deeper. I have gathered here uh, four different problems uh, where forecasting the next month uh, can give a lot of value to the respective domain expert. And I would like to draw your attention to the following uh, key observation here. Not all of these forecasting problems that you see here are equal. That is, uh, they're not equally simple or equally uh, complex to solve. Some of them, such as trying to predict the residential electricity demand for the next month, or trying to predict the rainfall levels for the next months, uh, are comparatively uh, easier estimations. But on the other hand, uh, food recalls, trying to estimate food recalls for the next month, uh, which is something that we all are very fairly interested in here, is a much more difficult estimation to make in comparison due to the complexity of the supply chains involved in uh, food manufacturing, uh, as Chris uh, highlighted earlier, as well as the, all the vastness of factors uh, one needs to take into account in order to be able to make a good estimation for that. And an even more extreme case here would be the problem of stock price evolution, which, uh, as you may know, is fairly, is notoriously difficult. A lot of people throughout the world try to predict the stock market for their benefit. But the truth is that uh, in the vast majority, this fails. And it fails because the price of the stock is influenced by so many factors and singular events. It's almost impossible to understand a specific pattern in this kind of data. Now, uh, we have seen in the previous slide that not all forecasting uh, problems are equal. 
here, I would like to draw your attention to you that not all forecasting models are equal. What, what, what does this mean? Um, typically, there doesn't exist a single algorithm that works reasonably well for all problems. So for example, as we can see here, this simplistic uh, plot, most of us would agree that when given two candidate models, forecasting models, the yellow one and the orange one, and given the ground truth, which is these actual values, uh, almost all of us would certainly like the orange model better. Uh, why is that? It's simply because the forecast of the orange model lies closer to the actual values uh, that we have observed compared to the yellow model. So this is to say that different algorithms give different accuracy and uh, our, our objective is to maximize the accuracy for a specific problem. Um, now, let me go a bit back, sorry about that. Um, every prediction uh, one sees in uh, Fudakai, uh, for every prediction one sees in Fudakai, for example, our, our platform, we have tried multiple candidate algorithms that we know that are suitable for this kind of problems based on the available literature. And uh, we only kept uh, the ones that are the best performers for this task based on their respective uh, accuracy and past data. So uh, let's dig a bit deeper here because uh, I would like to give you a sense of how uh, our current forecasting models, the ones that are currently available in Fudakai uh, work and what is our, our approach when forecasting the future incidents for a product or hazard of your supply chain. Uh, just a quick disclaimer here, no technical background is needed. We will just cover only the logic behind it. So no math involved. Uh, so if you're afraid of math, uh, be sure to stick. Uh, I, I will not uh, make any comment about math or stuff like that. So uh, let's imagine uh, a product of a company supply chain. Uh, let's say, for example, eggs. In order to build an AI model, an AI forecasting model, uh, that can forecast the future incident, uh, incidents around eggs, we will first have to know uh, what were the past incidents on eggs. Uh, luckily, our team of data engineers here at Agrono have done great work at this front uh, because uh, we're able to automatically track all officially announced uh, incidents as well as border rejections from all the major food safety authorities around the world. And from the moment an incident is reported to an official authority, such as FDA in US or EFSA in the European Union, we have it available in Fudakai in less than five minutes, which makes our jobs as data scientists a lot easier, while at the same time, our users benefit from instant notifications around the world that may affect uh, their supply chain. So the most important data set we have here, and this is very important, is uh, that will serve as input or forecasting model, is the historical incidents. Remember the example of uh, beer production in Australia we saw earlier. Our model needs to know what has exactly happened in the past for eggs in order to properly calculate continuation for the future. Uh, this is not uh, magic. You have to give a meaningful input uh, to our model in order to take a meaningful output. Uh, but this is not all. Um, aside from historical incidents, we also have available in Fudakai uh, the complete analytical data from a vast uh, number of monitoring programs from official authorities. Uh, these are called lab tests. And uh, they mostly come in two types. We have the laboratory testing results that are above limit. That is the hazard of interest is found to be uh, through chemical analysis above the concentration limit that is considered legal for a particular country, as well as those that uh, the, the substance of interest is found to be below the legal limit. So it's considered safe in other words. Uh, we use all these data as well additionally when available, of course, for the product or hazard that we're interested in, in order to inform our model uh, uh, even further. And last but not least, um, as Chris uh, highlighted earlier in the food safety, food safety landscape, uh, climate change is a very important factor in the food safety industry uh, worldwide. So uh, what we have done here is we have used the historical and current weather conditions, such as temperature, precipitation, humidity, and uh, many more uh, variables to all of our forecasting models that we consider them to be localized. Uh, what I mean by localized is, is the models that they try to calculate the number of incidents for a particular country of origin. For example, the number of incidents uh, 
regard, uh, of fruits and vegetables that originate from the United States, for example. Uh, every localized model uh, that specializes in a particular country now takes the historical and current weather conditions of that origin into account uh, as part of its training procedure. So, uh, all in all, uh, based on these types of data sources we see here, so historical incidents, lab tests, and weather conditions, uh, we create factors, or as we call them uh, in agronome features, uh, out of them that can highlight important aspects of this data. And we use all these factors as input to our forecasting model in order to train it. This is a term we use in, uh, in AI literature. Uh, right now, our models utilize more than 250 distinct factors in order to uh, learn how to best estimate the end goal, which is uh, always, uh, as, as we see here on the right, the number of future incidents for the next 12 months. This is what we try to predict. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, we talked about eggs. So let me let me show you uh, real quick an example of forecasting that I just took uh, out of Fudakai this morning. Uh, this is a small part of uh, the analysis, a user of the trends forecasting module of Fudakai that uh, he or she can see on the app. So in the graph here, uh, the green line some of you may see it as a dark blue line. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a debatable, the color. Uh, represents the historical incidence of the last uh, three years for eggs. Uh, while the red line represents a predicted incidence for the next year, as calculated by our AI model. Uh, at the same time, the orange line represents the predictions that our model made through the last two years as time went by. So this is like the prediction history, as we call it. As we can see here in this example, uh, and if we focus on the orange line, uh, we can see that we have successfully early highlighted uh, three different peaks. We have highlighted a noticeable incident peak uh, back in November 2022. We have also highlighted another such peak in July of 2023, which is here. And we have also highlighted one more peak in December of 2023, uh, but that, as you can see here, proved to be the largest of the peaks over the last three years. Uh, in the upcoming months of 2024, so in the future, uh, as you can see, uh, we will be able to empirically evaluate our model uh, once more uh, through the forecast incidents, because by then we will know the actual incidents that uh, are going to be announced. So the future, uh, and future announced uh, border injections and uh, recalls. According to the red line, as you see here, uh, there will be a couple of instant peaks in the next months, so one should keep an eye on it. Um, and just to, to wrap things up here before giving the floor back to Chris about that, my, my laptop misbehaved. Uh, before we continue with the rest of the agenda and give the floor back to Chris, I would like to emphasize that our goal, what is our goal here? What is the ideal outcome out of this approach? Um, I believe that, and all the team in Agrono and data science team believes that no matter how simple or complex uh, the AI technology behind problems such as this is, uh, the bottom line should always be that uh, we have to ensure that we get out what we get out of this technology is A, reliable for its users, is uh, B, thoroughly tested by us, the data scientists and the domain experts, and C, uh, it, it's also highly accurate performance-wise, that is based on continuous evaluation. Um, I'll give the floor back to Chris now to share his thoughts uh, on all that uh, before we continue. Chris? Thanks very much, Elias. That was a really nice explanation. And, and really just a, a moment to reflect on the potential of AI forecasting. So I think, as I said, would you explain much, much better than me? It is about the quality of the data that you collect and the quantity of the data that you collect, but also it's the, the different types of algorithms that can be applied. And, and here we've been applying algorithms for a very, very long time to data. So <clears throat> because it's called AI it seems to mystify it a little bit, but to me, this is just really, really good data sciences. And the other point I think is really important, and you, you mentioned it also, Elias, 
is having domain experts also interrogate the data and, and try to interpret the data. And that's why I really like working with Agronog so much. You, you, you generate lots of interesting data and I try to interpret that and, and find out actually, you know, is there something that, uh, that that's doesn't make sense or or is there is there a real trend there? So I think I would call it human intelligence meets artificial intelligence. That's that's the perfect combination. So thanks very much. So I think oh, back on to you now, Elias. Uh, yes, I think uh, now we'll proceed with uh, the audience poll. We have an we have a poll for you. Uh, let me see if we, you can see it. I think just to say, if what you can do is just put your, your mouse on top of the question or, or on top of the answers and you, you can see the full answers and then you can, you can have your vote. Uh, Chris, uh, sh uh, should you think uh, we should give uh, a minute to our audience in yes. order to respond? Yes. Let, let's let's uh, wait one moment. Just have a have a read through those and click which one you think is the is the most important, the most pertinent. And just to say, this is not proportional representation, you're only allowed one vote. <laughs> <laughs> so we're seeing some votes starting to come in now, which is fantastic. And also yeah. please, re please remember to put your questions into the chat box. First questions just arrived, which is fantastic. So please, please, any questions that you have on anything that you've heard or you're here, Please, please uh, continue. Just a few more moments to allow voting. This is just like the Eurovision Song Contest, isn't it? Except I don't- Who will I get the 12 points? I, I don't see United Kingdom on it, so we always get zero points. <laughs> Yeah. our tradition. Okay, I think we can end the poll now. Perfect. And I think well, we'll, we'll, see, right. we'll see the results of the poll a little bit later on. So back to you now, Elias. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let's uh, continue with uh, the central part of this webinar, which is to examine the three past outbreaks of uh, 2023. Uh, all three of them are very interesting market cases. Um, and what I want to, let's say, comment here is that all these cases are basically notable outbreaks that uh, took place sometime in 2023 and uh, were reported to various uh, news outlets in the food safety industry. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, were picked up by our forecasting models on Fudakai. That is, in other words, they were early highlighted. So we should uh, go through each one of them and see exactly how the models performed, what were the strong points, what were the weaknesses and stuff like that. Let's uh, begin with, uh, so our first case is we're gonna see uh, the case of norovirus in oysters. The second case is going to be, we're going to see the Listeria in uh, enoki mushrooms. And the third uh, case is going to be the lead poisoning in applesauce products. Let's start with the first case. Uh, that is um, a case of norovirus in oysters uh, back in late 2023. So uh, for this case, let's let's travel a bit back to last Christmas, Christmas of 2023, uh, where we had several people falling ill in France uh, due to a norovirus contamination uh, in oysters. Uh, actually, I didn't know that uh, before reading up on this case, uh, Chris, but France is one of the top European countries in uh, the production and consumption of oysters. Uh, and they have, I think, a remarkably, remarkably industry turnover of more than 400 million each year. So this is like a, a product that's very important to France. 
So what happened here? Uh, French authorities, in order to contain this outbreak, have temporarily banned the fishing and harvesting and selling of uh, selfies from a southwestern bay of the country uh, after detecting the presence of uh, norovirus in uh, oysters. On December 27th, it was announced that these selfies, the selfies from these areas must be withdrawn from the market, from sale, and people were advised not to consume them. Uh, now, uh, some words on norovirus. Norovirus is a virus that spreads uh, typically through contaminated food or surfaces and can cause uh, severe vomiting uh, and or diarrhea. Uh, while no serious cases have been reported uh, out of this outbreak, uh, this ban took a heavy toll on French oyster producers, especially given the fact that uh, we talk about Christmas and Christmas like a holiday season where a lot of producers expect to have like a good uh, turnover. So uh, what did our model pick up here in this outbreak and has it managed to highlight uh, this outbreak? Let's see. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And what we have here uh, it's basically a visualization in order to make it uh, simple for, for the audience. Um, as we can see here in this blue line, um, Fudakai has recorded a peak of more than 40 announced incidents for norovirus in oysters around Christmas of uh, 2023. Uh, and if you do a breakdown analysis of these 40 incidents here, you will see that 90% of these incidents originate from France, indicating that... Uh, this, uh, these, these incidents right here correspond to the norovirus outbreak we, saw, we just saw. Now, uh, I would like to make a very important uh, note here. So it's, I would like to draw your attention. Uh, the orange line here, which is the historical uh, incident, is basically what is the model predictions as time goes forward. And uh, these predictions are calculated on any given month for the next 12 months. So. What actually happens is that the orange line is kind of known 12 months in advance compared to the blue line. So keep this in mind. We first know what the orange line looks like, which is the forecasting made by our model uh, on any given time. And as months go by, we gradually start establishing the blue line as well, uh, which is basically the official announced incidence of the actual recalls and actual border injections. And this is not a forecast. So, Keep in mind that we know the orange line a lot earlier than we know the blue line. So what we see here is that our model managed to predict the outbreak several months uh, before uh, Christmas of 2023, uh, where this incident was recorded right here. Uh, and you can see here in this uh, rectangle box, box, which is highlighted, exactly that. Uh, the model early highlighted this particular uh, search. Now, at the same time, uh, looking uh, the whole graph and doing like a point by point comparison of the historical incidents, the blue line and the forecast incidents, the orange line for the last three years, we see that the model did a fairly good job at picking up the overall trends, uh, either being downward or being upward. Um, so another good question here regarding this uh, example is, was this outbreak something new for the food safety industry? As we can see, exactly one year ago, uh, on January 2022, uh, we had another similar uh, peak of incidents. So definitely, this uh, outbreak isn't something uh, new. You cannot classify it as something new. Uh, but what actually happened, and this is very important, is that this past outbreak informed our AI model uh, accordingly, as, as input now, as part of its training data set, which eventually led to the successful and timely prediction of the 2023 outbreak we saw here. So I would like to, I would like from you to keep here that forecasting is not some cryptic thing or some magic, but it's simply uh, a way to digest all of the available historical information we have about something, for example, here, norovirus and oysters, and produce through mathematical modeling the most data-driven and sensible scenario about the future evolution of, uh, of this time series. So the, it's nothing, uh, let's say, more mysterious than this. It's, uh, it's basically input and output. So uh, before we move to the next outbreak, 
let me let me share with you another screenshot from Sudakai that shows uh, France today in the global map that we have on trends forecasting. Uh, and you can see here that France is being highlighted uh, for a potential uptrend of norovirus in oysters uh, by almost 20%. We see a 20% trend compared to the previous year. So the question here, uh, the question here, Chris, is are we about to observe a similar outbreak uh, this Christmas? Um, of course, we don't know. Uh, we, we cannot know the future, but it's never late to take action to prevent another outbreak. Um, giving back the mic to you, Chris, for, for some reflections before we continue with the next outbreak. Thank, thanks, Elias. I mean, we, we all know norovirus is a really serious food safety risk now. And again, the trend is increasing outbreaks of norovirus. <clears throat> and again, we can think about all of the issues, why this is happening, but it's about pollution, it's about climate, changing agricultural practices. But I think <clears throat> norovirus is a very good example. We must expect there's going to be more outbreaks occurring. But then the question will be, on which product coming from which country. And I think, again, this, this is where the, 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 the data analytics really pays dividends, knowing where the next risk might be so that you can really immediately increase your amount of surveillance, your amount of testing, sampling and testing. So I think it is a very, very good case study. Elias, thanks. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so um, use case number two. Uh, Moving on to the second one. Uh, here we have uh, Listeria in the Noki mushrooms. And uh, let me give you a bit of context behind this outbreak. In early 2023, the Maryland Department of Health in the US found that samples of Noki mushrooms that were imported from China uh, were contaminated with Listeria following a similar discovery happened, happening earlier in Missouri. So this contamination was linked to a listeria outbreak that started in late uh, 2022 and resulted in five people from four different states uh, being uh, getting sick and getting hospitalized. Uh, CDC, which is uh, the National Public Health Agency of the US, announced that this investigation uh, and the outbreak ended on the 7th of April, 2023. Now, uh, let's see what uh, has been the model's behavior in this case. So we can, we can see here a similar uh, plot. And uh, again, Fudakai recorded a peak in the, number of announced in, in the number of announced incidents around April 2023, which is again the dark blue line here. Uh, as the, the CDC at the same time announced the end of the outbreak. And uh, you can see that the incidents starting decreasing shortly after that. So you can see uh, the Fudakai data here uh, completely reflecting uh, on the outbreak case. Um, again, focusing on the orange line of the model's predictions for Listeria in the Noki mushrooms, we can see that not only did the model manage to predict a year earlier uh, the peak of incidents before actually curing, but at the same time, uh, it managed to predict the exact number of incidents going to be announced, uh, which is fairly impressive. And uh, again, a point by point comparison here between the, the blue line and the orange line uh, attests to the fact that the model managed to pick up the overall trend. So uh, it managed to predict that it was going downwards when the incidents were decreasing and that it, it's going to be upwards when incidents were increasing. Uh, again, here, uh, as with the previous outbreak we saw, uh, this outbreak is not something new for the food safety industry, as uh, uh, Listeria infection is one of the most prevalent causes of uh, death from foodborne illnesses in the US, uh, according to the CDC. So this is a fairly studied and thoroughly researched outbreak. This is, I would like also to show to you a screenshot I took from Fudakai for Enoki mushrooms, uh, which shows one of the ways uh, a food safety professional that uses the app that uh, he or she can be informed of hazards that are likely to increase for Enoki mushrooms, given that he searched for Enoki mushrooms. And we can see here that 
And the overall trend of uh, new incidents is uh, 22% up compared to the previous year. So all in all, this is the case of uh, the Listeria infection in Nokia mushrooms. Um, Chris, uh, giving the mic back to you shortly. Many, many, many thanks. And again, this was a very nice um, case study. I mean, the first was around norovirus, where you expect to see lots of problems with norovirus in, in shellfish. But I have to tell you that before I saw this, I would have never have thought about inoki mushrooms being a risk in terms of listeria. It just would not be on my radar screen. And so, I, again, I think if you see these sorts of prediction models coming through, I think for many companies, a product like this, you probably wouldn't have a testing program or something and testing program in place for listeria. So if I saw something like this, I think an immediate risk assessment followed by some, some testing would, would, would be absolutely essential. And again, it just I think it shows you that listeria monocytogenes has been about for a long time. The difficulty is it's spreading to many, many different food products now. So I think, again, a great case study. Thank you, Chris. Um, last but not least, uh, we have the case of uh, lead poisoning in Applesauce products that occurred back in uh, early 2023. Uh, this is actually a fairly known outbreak from last year. Uh, I think out of the three, uh, it was the one that received uh, the most of the media attention. Uh, I saw a lot of articles uh, for, for this outbreak online. So what actually happened here briefly is that lead poisoning uh, traced in applesauce products uh, resulted in more than 200 cases being reported primarily in six-year-old children and younger uh, that showed that they had elevated levels, levels of lead in their blood, which uh, as you probably can guess is very, it's very dangerous. Uh, this outbreak was fairly big and uh, got spread at least across 33 states in the U.S. and also impacted the markets that were outside of U.S., such as uh, Cuba and the United Arab Emirates, uh, where product distribution took place. Now, uh, federal testing concluded that the recalled, the recalled up source products contained 200 times the safer consumption amount of lead. Uh, the source uh, now of the elevated levels of lead in the applesauce was traced by the FBA to cinnamon imported from Ecuador, which was used for its production. So as you can see here, the supply chain behind this outbreak is a rather complex one involving different raw materials, uh, different countries of origin and different countries of distribution. Um, as you can see from this food archive visualization here, uh, we have, we have uh, registered this sharp increase in the number of incidents for apple source products very strongly. So as you can see here, 2023, we had a lot of incidents around that. Now, um, let me go a bit, a step further. And here, uh, from a different point of view within Fudakai, uh, we can see that several food safety incidents that we have collected through our data platform about lead and cinnamon uh, were reported by the authorities over the last years. So you can see here um, cases from 2017, 2019, 2020. And the latest of which has been just six months before the outbreak uh, in May 2023 uh, by the FDA. Now, uh, our tailored predictions dashboard of Fudakai that analyzes the risk in uh, several herbs and spices uh, such as cinnamon, which is what we're interested in here, I managed to highlight this, uh, this particular risk uh, early in October of 2023, uh, that high content of lead uh, was a prominent new risk for cinnamon. Uh, so this is another example of how you can use artificial intelligence in order to be able to highlight risks that were not there before in the, in the food industry. Um, Chris, would you like to comment on the case of uh, lead poisoning? Yes, thanks. So this is this is a, a case that I followed very closely. Um, many people started to contact me when this happened, wondering 
how suddenly lead could get into cinnamon. And I, I it was no surprise or shock to me because it's it's a it's a way where people adulterate a number of different spices. But I think it was a big shock, a big surprise to many, many people. And and I think again, when I talk to people, there was never a thought, why would we possibly want to test for lead in cinnamon? It it just didn't make sense. So I think whenever um, you get a, a case like this happening, you might not understand it. I did because it was fraud. It was adulteration of food. And, and often issues about adulteration of food can end up as food safety incidents as well. So I think when, when, whenever you would see a trend like this, even if you don't understand why, it is a clear signal that something is wrong. And again, to protect your business, to protect your 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 consumers, some form of testing needs to be initiated really very very quickly. Thank you, Chris. Um, should we proceed uh, to questions from our audience? Yes. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> I think that the good news is with questions and the even better news, Elias, I'm going to ask you all of them, okay? <laughs> okay, okay, so I'm taking the, the hard questions? No, no, I think I think you'll manage them very easily. I'll, I'll read out the first is um, a question about the prediction. Elias, you said you're predicting the number of incidents in the next 12 months. How do you define an incident? Is this the equivalent to a recall? So good question. Um, this is basically a definition, let's say, decision here. But whenever you, whenever we refer to an incident in Fudakai, we basically mean either a market recall or a border injection. So we track both of them and uh, we put them all in one basket and we call this basket uh, in this in this bucket and we call this bucket incident. Of course, we track. Uh, border injections and market recalls individually. But here in all the visualizations we have seen, um, you, you see both of them actually. The combined, uh, the cumulative, uh, let's say the, the sum of both market recalls and border injections. That's very good. <clears throat> the second question is more, more general actually, Elias. And it, it, it's a question which I think is really good is it possible to predict what type of incidents could happen? And that's about microbiology, it's about fraud, it could be about chemical contaminants. Can you actually identify what the particular ingredient food commodity is and the risks associated with it around those key headings? Because to know there's going to be a problem with shellfish isn't overly helpful. Is it is it about heavy metal? Is it about a, a bacteria or or something else? Yeah, that's it. That's a very good question. So basically, I think that market recall is basically comprised of uh, some attributes. One of those attributes is like the associated product or commodity that is involved. For example, let's say cinnamon. That were that was the last uh, example, and. Uh, Another attribute of this market recall is the hazard, which uh, was found to be, let's say, above limit, or uh, it shouldn't be there. Uh, let's say, for example, that uh, this is lead. That was also an example. Uh, in Fudakai, we track all the historical market recalls and border injections. So what we, what we're actually doing is we track every possible combination individually. So. Uh, we not we don't let's say create a model only for based on the total number of uh, cinnamon incidents, but we also create a model for the number of incidents that evolved around cinnamon and the hazard was led, or the number of incidents that was uh, uh, around uh, was related to cinnamon and the hazard was a different one. For example, it was uh, pesticides. So for every possible combination of product hazard and country of origin that we have collected in Fudakai, we try to create a specific uh, specialized model for every such combination. So think of it schematically as we have a model for lead cinnamon, a model for pesticide cinnamon, 
a model for pesticides in uh, fruits and vegetables, a model for uh, fruits and vegetables originating from USA, and so on and so forth. Uh, that way, we are able to track uh, all the possible, let's say, uh, the, the possible ways that a product can have a, a, a significant hazard. Um, I hope this answers the question. Chris, would you like to add something else here? No, I mean, I think that, that was very, very helpful. And again, thank, thanks for the two uh, workshop participants to ask the questions and thanks, thanks for your answers. And just one, one question from me, Elias, because we, we talked a lot about climate change and <clears throat> going to be one of the biggest factors about food safety incidents and, and food recalls. How important do you think is incorporating weather data into your models now? Yeah, actually, in practice, uh, when we did the initial experiments, uh, incorporating weather data as factors into our models, uh, we saw that uh, it had a positive effect. That is, it had some information to give on the model in order to improve its accuracy when that model was specialized to a particular country. Uh, so, for example, if we, if we try to create a, an AI model that predicts the number of incidents of fruits and vegetables globally, then it's not, it's not beneficial to take weather data into account because you cannot have meaningful data like a worldwide temperature because this is something that it's so, it, it gradually evolves over time in such a slow pace that it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for the model. But when you focus on a particular country of origin, and you have the localized weather data for that origin, then this data uh, proved to be through experimentation that they were helpful in improving the accuracy of the specialized models. So that was the that was the insight here. That that's really really helpful. So thanks for that. So I think that's the end of our uh, Q and A session. And again, thanks for, for the asking of the questions. And uh, maybe we'll just move on to the next slide, Elias. Yes. And just this is where we're, we're going to kind of wrap up now with about five minutes left. For, for people who registered for this um, webinar, you were asked a number of questions just in terms of trusting new technologies and AI and, and food risk prevention. And, and it's, you know, to me, it was really interesting because this is, this is what I would have voted for as well. It is the main, I think, opportunity uh, for, for businesses is the early identification of emerging and unexpected risks. And I think the, the, the knocky mushrooms is such a great example of that. The, the lead and cinnamon is, is a great example of that. And I think the second, the second most uh, um, uh, category voted for was, was about um, to take into consideration emerging threats when performing supplier and ingredient risk assessments. And that is fantastic. That is informing your, 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 your due diligence. It's informing your audits. It's making your audits much smarter than they would have been. So I, I think I, I, I totally agree with, with um, the, uh, the, 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 what, what our participants voted for. Okay, so we're just about finished now. I think we um, are, are wrapping up now, but QR code, scan your the QR code and learn how to predict and prevent food risks from your supply chain using AI. There's a lot more information hiding behind that QR code. And I, I would strongly recommend that you uh, 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 zoom in on it and, and, and after this, have a have a read about the, about the uh, the wonderful systems that have been developed in terms of 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 um, managing risks and supply chains. So I think we're just going to finish off now with the results of the um, survey. I I hope they will be there. Yes. Would you like to share them, Chris? I have them available as well, but you should give it a try. I don't think I can share them. Ah, oh, okay. perfect, perfect, oh, yeah. perfect. Okay, yeah, so in in terms of 
what the participants of our webinar today thought was most important. And it's exactly the same as before. It's about early identification of emerging and unexpected risks. Fantastic. I, I think that is going to be such a powerful use of AI modeling in, in terms of managing food safety risks going forward. So I think I'll take this opportunity now to thank all of the participants of the webinar. Um, I think it's been incredibly informative. I always like listening to, to experts, machine learning experts, Elias. I think you give us a really good uh, um, um, breakdown of how the forecasting actually works. The case studies, I think we're all very, very good examples. So, so thank you very much for that. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Um, it, it really is about informing, trying to demystify um, that the role of artificial intelligence in food safety and food safety management systems. I personally am absolutely convinced it will become a major tool. In, in fact, in a few years time, people will wonder how did we manage without AI, like, like so many different um, technological and, and, and uh, computer-based inventions. So again, I'll say thank you all very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, don't be worried about eating uh, shellfish, knocky mushrooms, or, or applesauce. If, if you have that for your dinner tonight, I'm sure it's all very safe. So with that, I'll say thank you and, and goodbye.